There's nothing better than a steamed suet pudding or the smell of a home-baked pie baking in the oven. This is food that comes from the heart, and it's certainly food that's close to my heart. Today is all about my passion for the straightforward comfort food that generations have thrived on. Sweet or savoury, pie or pud, there's something for everyone on today's menu. Coming up, I'm baking my rich sausage plat helped by my guest, Hannah Pemberton, a big fan of one of its key ingredients, black pudding. Have you mixed up all the uh, sausage meat? Here? No, no, I'm about to do that now, chef. Sorry. I'm not a chef, I'm a baker. But, OK, sorry. I'm higher up the tree than a chef. Oh, OK. <laughs> I go back in time when I visit an old-fashioned sweet shop, looking for some inspiration for my next recipe. All the sweets I remember are all lined up in jars. It's nostalgia for me. It takes me back to when I was a kid again. Licorice is the old-fashioned flavour which goes into my steamed puddings. With the help of sweet shop owners, Keith and Gloria Tordov. So it's a tart. Tart. Raspberry flavour. You call me a tart. <laughs> Us British bakers use spices every day, and spice expert Aaron Capel takes me on an aromatic journey through the East without ever leaving my kitchen. This doesn't taste like what you'd expect, so you, no, you right. have to change the yeah, rule book. You do, but that's the whole point. I think change the rule book is what we should be yeah, doing. We haven't all got one of you in the kitchen, no, though, have no, we? But no, but everyone can play. I'll be turning my attention to the 1970s and creating a spectacular dessert based on a classic. That is a black forest gatto trifle infused with some beautiful spices. And my guests get to tuck in and tell me what they think of all of today's pies and puds. Comfort food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That's what it is. Yeah. Comfort yeah, food. Absolutely. North, where I grew up, the locals love their black pudding, and I do too. So I decided to incorporate it into one of my recipes and turn to the home of black pudding in search of inspiration. The heart of black pudding in Britain is indisputably Lancashire, and in particular, the town of Bury. It's still made here and still eaten here, but just how the locals eat it is what I want to know. Definitely a fan of black pudding. Breakfast, definitely grilled, full English breakfast. No other way. I like black pudding, yes, and so do my friends as well. And uh, I, I eat it, I'd have it for a, a tea, you know, for something, you know, for a snack. And, that. and it's very, very nice. I normally fry it. It's also boil, drill, whatever. But it's great anyway. I actually eat it with gammon and egg and pineapple, which sounds really strange, but it's absolutely gorgeous. Black pudding has been made in Berry by one company continuously for over 100 years, and it's owned by Debbie. What makes the black pudding special is that is the, re the actual recipe itself. Um, there's lots around, but these are, you know, quite special. Everybody seems to like them. Making black pudding is not for the faint-hearted. Dried pig's blood and cleaned intestines are turned into nearly 2,000 tonnes of pudding every year. Yeah, everybody wants to make a good black pudding. And they, do, they enjoy doing it as much as I do, and I think that's what makes it so successful. Black pudding is not to everyone's taste, it's true, but even some of Britain's top chefs swear by it. I asked three local ladies who love using black pudding at home to show me step-by-step step exactly how they like to cook it. Michelle, who lives on the outskirts of Berry, Lindsay, who lives in Leyland with their two cats and three chickens, and Hannah, who lives in Didsbury, South Manchester. Ladies, over to you. So first up, Michelle and her black pudding with scallops. First of all, I boiled a pan of uh, chicken stock and I put frozen garden peas into it with a bit of mint and salt and pepper. In the other frying pan, I fried my black pudding off, returned that to a plate and then I put the scallops in and fried those off. I blitzed the uh, pea mash and then plated it all up. I'm going to finish it off with a bit of balsamic glaze. 
Michelle's is a straightforward recipe and one you often find as a restaurant starter, but it's an easy and honest way of serving black pudding. Next, it's Lindsay, who likes their black pudding in phyllo parcels with rhubarb. I like the um, combination of local ingredients, but with something different like phyllo pastry. First of all, you saute the finely chopped black pudding in a little oil in a pan. You then remove that, fry the onion and the rhubarb just for a few minutes to start the softening process. And then add some cider, which you then simmer for a little while till you have like a thick paste. You then add the black pudding back to the pan, pushing it up and then allow that to cool. Then you make your parcels by rolling out your phyllo pastry and putting about a spoonful in each one. Form your pastry parcels and then pop them in the oven for about 15 to 20 minutes until they're golden. Lindsay recommends serving these lovely parcels with a sweet chilli sauce dip, rhubarb and black pud. Nice one, Lindsay. Finally, it's Hannah's turn. I think black pudding is a really great ingredient because it's thrifty, it tastes fantastic, and it's really nice to be cooking with something that's an off-cut that would otherwise go to waste, and cooking something that's traditionally British. Hannah's making a steak and Guinness black pudding pie. Combine the onion, the celery, the carrot, and the beef. Mix those together with the stout, Worcester sauce, and a generous amount of seasoning. Cook that on a hob with the lid on, for a couple of hours until the meat starts to soften. Skin your black pudding and then cut that up into large chunks and mix that through the pie mix. And then you need to prepare your pastry case. Line the inside of a baking case with puff pastry. You want to part bake that. And then when that comes out, you spoon the mixture into the base of the pastry case. And then you take another piece of pastry and you lay that over the top pop a hole in the centre, trim off the excess and bang it in the oven and it will be done in about 30 to 40 minutes. Hannah's dish is closest to how I want to cook with black pudding, but I'm going to be using sausage meat in my pie. Hannah, you use black pudding in a pie like I'm going to actually. I think black pudding is more eaten in the north. They're mm. not as passionate down south. It's a slight cultural thing. Do you find that yourself? Um, I've only ever really lived in the north, so I know loads of people who are proper black pudding advocates. And you don't just eat it at breakfast, you can eat it with loads of different things. So you can stick it in risotto, or you can have it crispy with other things, or there are other interesting things that you can do with risotto. it. Risotto? Um, yeah, like, you wouldn't put it in the risotto, but you might have it, like, um, sliced really finely and then crisped up, and you would have it dressed are you, are you in it, are you, that. Are you saying it's like a northern truffle? Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe a bit of a northern truffle. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you have it. Black pudding is a northern, northern truffle. truffle. <laughs> OK, now I'm going to make a poor man's beef wellington. This is no normal sausage meat plat. Fresh buttery pastry, mushrooms, caramelised onions and, of course, the deep flavour of British black pudding make this pie rock. If you could chop up that black pudding. How finely diced would you like it? Um, I still like it, you know, fairly chunky. Yeah. If you can mix that, just chop it up, mix it with the sausage meat and pop it in there for me. OK, All cool. Right, thank you very much indeed. Now, I've got some chestnut mushrooms here, which are broken down and chopped into very small pieces. Pop these into a pan, and then you cook these down. And the only reason why you're going to cook it down is to evaporate most, if not all, the moisture inside that mushroom. And it takes about five, ten minutes, that's it. Once you've done that, you need to pop it into a processor and just literally blitz it down so it ends up in a paste like that. So it's fairly dry, which is what you want in the bottom of your sausage plat because you don't want a soggy bottom soaking through to that pastry at the bottom. Nobody wants a soggy bottom. You don't want a soggy bottom, do you? It's not a good idea to have a soggy bottom. Have you mixed up all the uh, sausage meat? Here? No, no, I'm about to do that now, Chef. Sorry. I'm not a chef, I'm a baker. Uh, OK, sorry. I'm higher up the tree than a chef. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK. Next, chop up a red onion. Keep the sides fairly chunky. It's nice to get a taste of it in the pie. Got another little job for you. There you go. Is that all right, You can baker? shred that thyme mm -hmm. and dump it straight in there. OK. Now, the sausage meat I'm using is quality butcher's pork meat. 
but using good sausages works well too. Just take off the skins. I love sausages. So the best thing to do is actually pick the sausage that you that like. You like, yeah. And it could be pork, it could be venison, it could be anything. Yeah. But pick a sausage meat that you like yeah. and use that. Yeah. But you then heighten it, give it that earthiness with the pudding. Yeah. And that little bit of time in it. You'll see for yourself when you try it, but trust trust me, it does work. Yeah. When I was watching them, um, you know, how they make black pudding, you think, Grand, sometimes I'm one of those people that really don't want to know where it comes yeah. from. Because when I saw it, I went, do you yeah. know what I mean? I couldn't work in there. I could eat it, yeah. but I don't really want to see it. Yeah. Does that make sense? I'm quite happy to watch people from the distance of my TV making it, but I think that being in the room while it's being put into the casings, I don't know how. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how I'd feel about that. Because it's the pig's blood is yeah. the big thing that people go, no. As no. soon as you mention that, they go, don't want to know. Yeah. They just get put right off. Now, into this pan with the onions, we're going to add the butter and I'm going to add the sugar brown sugar. Now, this will start melting and start caramelising these onions. Right. Now, you need to cook these for about 10 minutes, and then you add the, the sherry vinegar straight into it and then reduce that down again for another 5, 10 minutes, and you end up with something that looks like this. It's beautiful and soft, and they smell so sweet. Smell what does the sherry vinegar add to it, then? Well, the flavour oh, wow. and the sweetness. Yeah, that smells fantastic. It smells great, doesn't it? Yeah, lovely. It? So your component parts are your sausage meat with the black pudding and the thyme, you have your mushroom paste, and then you have your caramelised onions, and I've got some sesame seed. Now it's puff pastry time. This really needs to be made in advance, and it keeps well until you need it, even frozen. Keep this pastry cool and handle it as little as you can. Is this uh, homemade by you, or is it ready roll like I would use? You walk into my kitchen, call me a chef, and then say, <laughs> is that bought pastry? And then I expect you to feed me, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, this is where you start to build your sausage plas. So to start with, get your mushrooms and place it sort of down the middle. Get in there, use your hands, make a little channel, leave a little gap at the end. I'm going to layer the sausage meat and black pudding mixture on top of the mushrooms. It forms a nice ridge running along the top. So you can see where the sort of beef wellington idea come mm. from, you know? Because normally you just put a bit of fillet in there. But I'm using some sausage meat packed out with some beautiful black pudding. I hope you like this, by the way. Yeah, I think it's going to be delicious. And top the meat mixture with caramelised onions. This is going to taste fantastic. You've got mushrooms, you've got the sausage meat, you've got the black pudding inside with the thyme, then you've got that gorgeous onion in there as well. To make the plat, take a sharp knife, trim off the ends and the sides. Stretch the corners, fold over the top and push down to seal the ends. Cut two centimetre strips all the way down the pastry on each side of the filling and fold over to create the plat effect. So you fold over one and go over the other side. So you take it from corner to corner and likewise mm. over again all the way down, and this forms a beautiful sort of little plat lattice work on the top, which looks, looks great, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks lovely. I think it's going to be delicious. It's reminded me of, like, a giant, like, glamorous sausage roll. Well, yeah, that's, that's pretty that's much what, what it, it is. is. Yeah. <laughs> Just tuck it underneath, nice and neat. Just make sure it's tacked all the way down. And that, basically, is your sausage plat. Get some egg wash, quite a rich one, and brush it all over the top with egg wash. What makes the egg wash rich? I've used mainly yolk, so right. I've got one egg and a, and a yolk in there, which makes it very yellow, which gives it yeah. the colour, that golden, golden colour. Now, once you've got all your egg wash on the top, get some sesame seed and just coat the top in the sesame. Mm. And what happens when the sesame goes into mm. the oven? The sesame seeds, when they hit the heat, they explode and release mm. their juices and all the oils and resins inside, and that gives you that slightly nutty flavour on the top. So this is going to bake off at 200 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. I'm going to pop it in there now. You can see what's happened. It's roasted all the sesame seeds on the top. Gorgeous That's golden amazing. colour on the top. Let's take a layer. Oh, that looks amazing. And there you have it. That is a sausage plat fit 
for any table. Beef Wellington, you should be quaking in your wellies. This pie has everything, not just looks. The black pudding gives the mushrooms and sausage meats a deep, savoury taste, which is balanced by the sweet onions. Hannah, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer before we eat it. OK. Still to come on Pies and Puds, my scrumptious steamed licorice sponges, inspired by my trip to an old-fashioned sweet shop. For me, it was like it was going back to flavours I'd forgotten. Mm. I think that's what sweets do, they rekindle all those memories from childhood and as you're growing up, that's what it's about. And I go back to the past again, but this time to the 1970s, bringing back an old classic, the Black Forest Gatto, made with sumptuous chocolate custard. The addition of cream just takes it to the right consistency that you're looking for in a custard. First, I'm spicing up my kitchen. A huge number of my recipes use spices and we bake with them all year round. We keep spices in our cupboards for years without thinking about them. Pepper, cloves, nutmeg. But chef turned spice expert Aaron Capel is here to tell me there's more to my spice store than I think. Hello, Aaron. I quite do. It's, it's difficult to impart to the people watching the smells uh. that are happening at the moment. So what basically have we got here? This is like um, taking a stab at like a, an English kitchen um, spice rack, you might say. It's easy to forget that pepper is actually a spice. Aaron has brought in some pepper that is not just freshly ground, but freshly picked and imported. In this game, I have to guess what type each is. What's this? Is this so pepper? for you to guess now, Paul. You have to see if you can guess which ones they are. So I've got four different peppers here, and I don't know which is which. I wouldn't normally just eat pepper. It's like, like tasting a wine to a certain extent. You just yeah. want to get a really good nose full of it. You smell it, you don't eat it. Yeah, you smell it first, because then that kind of, oh, OK, and it starts to play these little memories in your, in your head from things of the past. And then when you actually taste it, you're getting the, both the flavour and the taste of it. You know the first thing that came in? It's very peppery. <laughs> <laughs> it's pepper. Wait, so this is white pepper. White pepper is essentially exactly the same as black pepper, mm. but the black husk has been taken off it. That's all white pepper is. Really? Absolutely. A bit mustardy as well. Beautiful. Now we're going, absolutely. It's going, yeah, absolutely, like wasabi almost. It's going in that kind of direction, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to steak and ale pie, no worries. Perfect. Now, the next one, which is slightly darker, well, this is a bit more earthy than, mm -hmm. than the first one. It's definitely stronger. This is long pepper. This was the original pepper that the Romans used to trade in before black pepper was discovered. And works really well with sweet stuff, that does. The problem is, when you put, like, uh, salt and pepper in a dish, yeah. you know what it's going to taste like. This, is... this, this doesn't taste like what you'd expect, so you, <laughs> no, you're you right. have to change the no, rule book. You do, but that's the whole point, and that's what I'm all about personally. I think changing the rule book is what we should be yeah, doing. We haven't all got one of you in the kitchen, no, though, no, have no, we? But, no, but everyone can play. So how would you use this long pepper? Use it in place of things like allspice and nutmeg. It's great with fruits. I've been using it in chutneys, in jams, in preserves. So moving on to this. Yes, indeed. Again, a very different looking pepper. It packs a punch. Yeah. Do you know what this one is? This is black pepper. So this ah. is black pepper that, like you said at the beginning, fresh. Ev yeah, but it's totally different to what Isn't I'm used it? to. Like you say, now that the spices are fresh, that you can actually sort of easily distinguish them. Aaron has brought in one of my favourite spices, nutmeg. Is it a nut? It's actually a seed. It's growing just like a conker. You crack open the green shell. Inside the green shell, then, you see, like, this black sort of nut, this dark brown nut. And around the dark brown nut is this, um, the lacy husk, which is mace. Mm. So you take off the mace, you crack the brown sort of casing, and you end up with the seed, which is nutmeg. I love nutmeg. I use nutmeg in sweet things, like Yorkshire curd tart and rice pudding but almost never in savoury. But Aaron has cut me a frittata, a posh omelette to you and me, with eggs, potatoes, blue cheese, and freshly grated nutmeg. Not too in your face. No, it's not. Only just there. You get it, you get it there at mm. the end. It works well. Cloves are another spice that us British bakers love, especially around Christmas time, it seems. 
cloves to me have that sort of festive appeal, but to me they've got a real deep sort of fruitiness to them. So what is a clove then? I mean, is with it clove, seed, bark? With a clove pour, you're eating flowers, you're eating pure sunshine. Ah. <laughs> what it actually is, you know how it's a ball and, and socket on, so you've got the little ball on top? Yep. Um, well, these little bits coming up, uh, these little pieces here, these are the sepals, so the little leaves that didn't form. The oh. little, little ball is actually the petals that just haven't opened up as yet. Oh, is that so all that is? Literally, yeah. So that's been dried out? Correct, exactly that, yeah. yeah. It's a dried flower, you could say, almost, before it obviously blooms into a flower. To convince me, Aaron's added cloves into a venison burger. So with venison, you might normally think like sort of juniper, orange, pepper. Chocolate. Cho chocolate, yeah, absolutely. It's got a little bit of warmth to it, it adds to it. I think putting that on a, on a barbecue. There we are now. There it is, right there. I can taste the freshness in Aaron's spices and storing them correctly is vital to keeping them. Keep your spices into air, in an airtight jam jar. Mm -hmm. but put them in your cupboard so it's out of the way, but not above the hob. You don't want, you don't want them warm. It needs to be kind of like a coolish place. That's been fantastic. Good man. Later, I'll be asking Aaron to help me spice up a classic dessert recipe as I reinvent a favourite pudding with pepper. But first, I'm going back to being a kid again. I'm making a traditional pudding that's full of flavour and memories of my childhood. I want to rekindle that sense of fun and enjoyment we all remember from when we were kids. In Pateley Bridge, North Yorkshire, is the oldest sweet shop in England, first opening its doors in 1827. If you're looking for true nostalgia, this is the best place to start, the classic ye old penny sweet shop. Look at it. It takes me back to when I was a kid again. It's got everything in here that I'm looking for. Now, I'm itching to get inside, but more importantly, I want to try my favourite sweets and find inspiration for my true nostalgic pud. The shop is a family business and is run by Keith Tordoff and Paul and my wife, I'll introduce my His wife, Gloria. Hello. And their son, Alexander, and his partner, Kirsty. Hello, Kirsty, there. This is. Well, I'm a kid again. You must be a kid working in a place like this. Oh, you've got to be in a sweet shop. Absolutely. It's, it's nostalgia for me. I look around, all I see is from, when, from the age of four to the age of 14, all the sweets I remember are all lined up in jars. And I, I, they are springing back to me. I'd forgotten half of this thing. Like a lot of us, I think my first love of flavours started in a sweet shop. <gasps> Toasted tea cakes. Ah! Pebbles, a school favourite, a cop cop. Do you have cough candy flavour twist? Yeah, cough. No. Yep. Sorry, I'm like a kid. I really could eat these sweets all day. Which one is your favourite? I've got to say Yorkshire Mixture. I'm from Yorkshire, I'm a Yorkshire lad, and it's got a little bit of everything as Yorkshire Mixture. We've got in it the, obviously, the pear drop, we've got the fruit rock, and one thing that's very, very important, every single one must have a fish in it. That's tasty. Now, believe it or not, I'm here to do some serious research and I want some advice about an old-fashioned flavour that would go well in a steam pudding. I'm looking for something that's got a bit of kick to it, a bit of character to it, and something I can put in a pudding that remind me of my youth. Well, I think for memories, it's got to be uh, the sweet peanut. Oh, yes. The smell, if you can smell the actual sweet peanut. It's just like a peanut, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. They're delicious, those. Peanut isn't the flavour I'm looking for, but I'm certainly enjoying reminiscing. Now, I'm thinking of another one. Yeah. I'm thinking strawberry. Mm. I think it's got to be, for memories, the strawberry bonbon. Oh, it's chewy. It has got that strong strawberry flavour. One thing that has stuck in my mind, one flavour that I haven't hit, and I've seen it a couple of times in the shop, licorice. Now, licorice is one of those flavours and textures that you either love it or you hate it. Yeah. In Keith's shop, he has an array of licorice I can try. And first, I choose licorice bark. All licorice starts here. All licorice starts from the root. They grow the plant. The plant itself, above ground, grows up to about four foot in height. And this is then, to get all the licorice products, is actually boiled to extract the juice from it. It tastes like bark. Yes. It does taste like bark. It's like chewing yeah. on a tree. Yeah, yes. But then you've got that, that sort of sharpness coming through. But I want to try licorice that's a bit more familiar. 
Now, you've got some in there which actually is one of my dad's favourites, a Pontefract cake. Can I you try can try it, of course you can, yes. Let's help yourself. Always got the seal on it, the stamp. Which you can see, what is the seal? The seal was originally um, Wilkinson's Pontefract factory, and they, it used to always be stamped by hand in that, yeah. and the ladies could do about 30, 35,000 of these per day. Bit of aniseed added to it, bit of treacle added to it. That's the key thing, I think, is, is, the, is, is that treacle. Yes. And uh, treacle's been added, and you can almost, you can taste that now. Yes. When, you, when you said it, I thought, yeah, I've got that. This helps me a lot. Why are my taste buds taking all the flavours? It's obvious that Keith knows everything when it comes to sweets. Sugar came to the UK in the 1700s, but it was scarce and expensive. This meant those selling sweets, known as confectioners, were well thought of. In high society, the confectioner, he was deemed to be the top of his trade. The baker was classed as a mere baker. Hang on a minute. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about bakers. Mayors of Pompeii were bakers. But with the advent of travel, technology, sugar started to become more readily available and suddenly became more affordable. These days, we don't just want our sweets to taste sweet. Oh, no. Kids today want something a little bit more sour. I'll show you this one. It's a super sour fizz bomb. But there was a Mark I, and this is the very, very latest Mark II. When, when was this done? This was literally done in the last few weeks. Really? Yes. Oh, that is quite a modern sweet, then. Yeah, oh, very modern, yes, yeah. OK. With trepidation, I'll say, can I have one, please? I'll have to give you the warning first that they are extreme and can cause irritation on your mouth. Really? Absolutely. OK. Mm. Is that acid? Oh. <laughs> The jaw, gone. Uh. Oh, you like me sick. That ain't good for a sweet shop. <laughs> Dear me, that's like um... battery acid. Yeah, <laughs> you could run a car on that. <laughs> yes, it, it 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 feels like it's burning. Yes, yeah. While I'd recover from that super modern sweet, Keith's son Alexander is making sweets using a technique that's over a hundred years old. We have some sugar here, boiling with water, bit of cream of tartar. It's up to temperature now, about 154 degrees. To make the sweets, Alexander simply works and cools the sugar mix, adding in colouring and flavours. Today, he's adding mint and aniseed. I've never done anything like this before, you know. I mean, I've, I've worked with sugar before, pulling sugar. Yeah. But not adding flavours, not really. He colours sometimes, but yeah, not, yeah. not flavours. Yeah. That's amazing. Not to it. The smell, wow. Once the sugar mix is cooled, it's then shaped into a block, ready to go through a sweet roller. This is how they turn out. Yep, and then when it cools, you just pop them all off and you've got individual sweets. You just drop them. Oh, really? Yep. That's all you do. So you just... Ah! Like that. <laughs> got a nice flavour. I enjoyed that. Well, after eating all those sweets, I've finally made my decision on which flavour I'm going to put in my next recipe. It's licorice. That flavour is delicious. And that flavour in a nostalgic pudding, for me, is the bomb. Keith, Gloria, I had such a great time that day. For me, it was like it was going back to flavours I'd forgotten. Mm. I think that's what sweets do, they rekindle all those memories from childhood and as you're growing up, that's what it's about. Saturday morning, every morning, I'd get my pocket money about 8 o'clock in the morning and they had the penny bits there. I'd have a quarter of sweets and some of the penny sweets I'd get back. And there was occasion where I'd just eat and eat until I was sick. Yeah. What a way to get there. Then. Happened on more than one occasion. Yeah. Very colourful. I admire the necklace, but oh, yeah. you haven't got that. You eat trump me. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> trump you that's but not real, though, have, is it? Have a, have a nibble not, on that and you'll need a dentist. That's not real. <laughs> exactly. That's real. That's real. That's oh, a yeah. proper I'm one. I'm not swapping because it's half eaten, is yours. <laughs> <laughs> you brought another load of sweets here. Good on you. <laughs> um, what I'm going to use is actually the licorice. Before you get to that point, Paul, can I just say that we've got a bit of a surprise for you today, yeah. actually? Oh, because yeah. Because we've gone to a lot of trouble, a lot of experiments, a lot of research. research. And I know you, you weren't Lots expecting this today. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, I love it. Hollywood eyes. <laughs> I've got it. There we are. And actually, I'm honoured. It's, it's, it's not a nasty it's trick, not though. It's not nasty. It's, it's, a, not it's a, a tart. Tart? 
raspberry flavour. You call me a child. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you wear a necklace... I love that. You know what's happening now? My, my taste buds have been... They're like fine-tuned instruments. And it's been assaulted. It's just been kicked in its seat. <laughs> yeah. It's just been welly. That's lovely. Thank you. I'm, I'm made up with them. Thank you. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is a licorice, a licorice theme pudding. Now, the idea of coming from the licorice was when I was over there. Licorice is one of those big favourites of mine. And I think it'll work well in this steam pudding. My steam puddings are surprisingly light and fluffy, and the licorice gives it a fruity tang that runs beautifully through the sponge. If you don't like licorice, these puds could change your mind. Now, to start with, I'm going to add all the ingredients. I've got flour, sugar, I've got three eggs going in. Once these have gone in, basically it's an all-in-one mix. You just mix it all together. So throw it all in, three eggs. Then I've got some butter. Then this is the interest to me. I've got some baking powder in there. You want a little bit of rise from it, lighten it up. And I've got... What's that? Oh, it's treacly. Treacly. It's licorice extract. Right. The this pure, is, this the, is pure the pure stuff. From, yeah. from the sticks. The yes, sticks. exactly. Get it in the mix. Now, this will give it a lovely aniseed licorice flavour, but also just darken it that little bit, a little bit as well into, into the pudding. Mix the ingredients together until well blended, and it's as easy as that. Perfect. This is the basic mixture, which I'm going to spoon into there. And these are the little pots and bacon. I've just buttered the inside of them. And could you pass me four of those little Absolutely. Catherine wheel yep. things, please? But they'll be different colours, different centres. We've got various names, spogs, horse cakes, jelly S buttons. Really? Yes, all different names, you oh. see. Pink and blue things, Pink and blue. Yeah. Yeah. I can't use that, you see, so I've got to take... Oh, we oh, need those. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Where's not one, that? Place the licorice into the bottom of the buttered and lined moulds, then simply spoon in the mixture, allowing a bit of space for the sponge to rise. So what I've got is my four pots that are filled with this licorice sponge. I've got the licorice at the bottom. And what I'm going to do is just pop onto each one. Silicon paper goes on first, just to prevent the pudding from sticking to it. Then a little bit of foil on top of that and squeeze it down just to seal it off slightly. You don't need to wrap these up. So on each one, pop a bit of the paper, then the foil. Then place the moulds in a steamer. I made some earlier, which are already steamed. I've steamed these for about 45 minutes on simmer. Now, these are going to pop back in here to finish off. These have been steamed. Now, when you look at this, you can see how it's domed slightly yeah. as they've grown in the, in the little pot. Oh, ah, oh, there we are. Perfect. There you go. Ah, they've kept the shape. Oh, perfect. There you have it. Licorice puddings. This wonderfully light and buttery pudding is a real winter warmer that hits the spot every time. Thank you very much, guys, because I thoroughly enjoyed myself at your shop. Thank you for the inspiration with the licorice and a big thank you for my sweets. Many thanks. We're going to have to wait a little bit longer to eat this. But to eat that, a little bit of cream. If you're in the north, a little bit of custard. <laughs> Earlier, Aaron Capil taught me a thing or two about spices. White pepper is essentially exactly the same as black pepper, mm. but the black husk has been taken off it. That's all white pepper is. Really? Absolutely. And he's brought with him some homemade blondies made with white pepper, perfect for my next dish. Now, it is a twist on a trifle. And what I mean by that is it's a 70s twist because I'm going to use the idea of a Black Forest Gatto. Now, if you're a fan of the Black Forest Gatto, a German classic dessert, then you're in for a treat as I give it a twist and turn it into a trifle using this same combination of flavours, chocolate, cherries and kirsch. But for added effect, Aaron is going to use his knowledge of spice to add a twist to my recipe. These are the cherry and chocolate and I believe pepper. That's right. Blondies. Yeah, absolutely. 
Mm. OK, <laughs> we'll, we'll try them later. Come um, on. I like the idea of it, though. Cool. I'm going to utilise it into my trifle. That'll be the base of my trifle. Lovely. The first job I'm going to do is actually get my pan on and get my cherries. Now, these are the black cherries in the syrup, which I'm going to put in the pan now. I'm just going to reduce this down a little. Straight in. Now, what would you put with that? To bring out the fruitiness, cloves. If you infuse cloves into the syrup, I think that okay. might add something to it. If I give you a little pestle and mortar... Very good. ..take what you want and uh, grind it down. If you haven't got any fresh cloves, you don't have to put it in. <laughs> it's just we're trying to experiment and see what it's like. I trust this man. Now, in a pan, I've got some milk and cream here, which are going to go straight in. Ooh. Bring this up to the boil. Now, have you, got, have you ground up that clove for me? Yeah, what I've done is just crushed them so they can infuse rather than going... Doesn't, cos we're going to... Are we going to strain it? No. All right, I'll keep going. Crush it down. <laughs> Can't get the staff nowadays. <laughs> OK, egg yolks in there. Caster sugar straight in. I'm going to add some flour to it, and this will be the thickener in the custard. This is known as creme patissiere, or creme pat, as I like to call it, which is thick, flour-based egg custard. And when the cream and the milk have come to the boil, you then drop it straight onto this mixture, and then we're going to put it straight back on the pan again and cook out the flour. Have you managed to do that clove I have yet? finally, Paul. Sorry, here we go. Let's have a look. Thank you. Is that okay? Oh, beautifully done, Lovely. yes. <laughs> I'm going to pop this clove in with the cherries. Lovely. That should infuse quite nicely. I'll just give it a little bit of a stir. It does smell good, I'll give you Doesn't that. Doesn't it? There you yeah, go, it does. <laughs> OK. Now, over here, the, the milk's just boiled. I'm going to add that to the mixture. Give this a stir. This is a classic sort of creme pat, you know. It's, it, it's a classic sort of custard. Just mix that in. Make sure it's all dissolved. A good technique, sir. Now, nutmeg. Indeed, sir. How much? I would say maybe just a, uh, like six or seven rubs. Now I've got some chocolate here. I'm going to break up. Now this is going to go. This is going to turn our traditional creme patissiere into a chocolate one. Break the chocolate into pieces and tip into the creme patissiere and very gently stir until it's all blended in. Then pop it back onto a low heat and keep stirring. Don't walk away from it at this stage because the, the flour begins to cook out pretty much straight away. So keep turning it. And once you see it beginning to hold on the spoon, take it off the heat and put it into a bowl to chill down. And it almost sets like a jelly. You wobble it, and it will begin to settle very, very quickly. That's when it's ready. Once it's chilled, the best way to do it is put a, what they call a cartouche, which is basically a circle of silicon paper on the top of that, and then pop it in the fridge. It just stops it from skinning. Now, once you've done that, you end up with this. Once the mixture cooled, I added double cream to create a deliciously thick chocolate custard. <laughs> Yeah, that's very good. And that's got your nutmeg in it as well. Beautiful. And it does bring out that chocolate. It does, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. It's a great blend. Yeah. Next, drain the clove-infused Morello cherries. You can smell that clove. It's gorgeous, isn't it? I'll leave them over there to cool. I'm breaking up Aaron's peppered blondies a little. These sweet dessert bars will make a delicious alternative to sponge. There's white and black pepper in there. Again, now you've tasted the black pepper and the white pepper, you can see possibly why I've used both of them to try and create a balance. It's quite sweet, yeah. Yeah. One sweet. Absolutely. OK. Lovely. I love trifles. It's brilliant. <laughs> exactly. I love trifle with yeah. a passion. Probably one more will do. Perfect. Then soak the blondies with Kirsch. This fruity brandy made with Barella cherries will add some heat and a kick to your trifle. Put a layer of cherries on there. Now, here I've got some cherry jam. Again, real cherry overload here. Spread that over the top. Next thing I'm going to do is add the chocolate. Now, this chocolate mixture it's gorgeous. gets poured on. So you added cream to that as well? I add a little bit of cream to it, because what happens is, when it goes in the fridge, it can solidify. Oh, yeah. Uh, creme pat tends to do that anyway, but the addition of cream takes it to the right consistency that you're looking for in a custard. So again, just spread it around nice and evenly across the top. 
bring out my mascarpone cream, mascarpone cheese, to which I'm going to add some cream to that. Now, I'm deconstructing a classic 70s Black Forest Gatto. Black Forest Gatto is protected in Germany. There's yeah. certain things you can do with it. Gosh. They'd probably go crazy if they realised I was putting <laughs> it in a trifle. Whisk together the mascarpone and double cream until light and fluffy and not too stiff. Now, the cream goes on top of the chocolate. This is where you begin to salivate. <laughs> I'm doing that already. Now, that is pretty much finished, but... <laughs> good. I've got some chocolate. It needs more chocolate. Now, do you know what I would do with that for as well? What's that? I would also probably grate on some pepper to keep the theme going. Pepper? Yeah. I love you, Aaron. I really do. <laughs> but shut up. But don't push it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll put a little bit on, OK? Sweet. Yes. Tiniest bit, i say. A little bit of white pepper <laughs> on the top. That's enough. <laughs> and there you have it. That is a black forest gatto trifle infused with some beautiful spices. If this hasn't made your mouth water, I don't know what will. Dreamy chocolate custard, clove-infused Morello cherries, and blondies soaked in kirsch. A classic with a twist. Thank you, Aaron, for your help. Oh, and thank you very much for teaching me a little bit thank more you. about spice. But we're going to have to wait a little bit longer before we get a chance to try it. My guests are ready to eat. Today, it's been all about home and nostalgia. With my posh sausage plat, a real celebration of black pudding, which I hope Hannah will enjoy. My steam licorice sponges that can be served with cream or custard, inspired by my visit to Keith and Gloria's sweet shop. And my black forest trifle, which brings a 70s classic right up to date, with Aaron's blondies instead of sponge, and his extra touch of white pepper. <laughs> I the trifle was the way to go. Shall I pass it around, maybe? I think we just took in, guys. I think I'll start with the sausage plat. I think I'll just keep it a little bit savoury to start with. <laughs> wow. Mushroom is really good with the black pudding, isn't it? Mm. And I hadn't thought of cooking it with onion before, but it's lovely and sweet. Comfort food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That's where it is. Yeah. Comfort yeah. food. My sausage plat has gone down well. Will my steamed licorice sponges hit the right spot? I must admit, it's the first time I've ever had a, a pudding with licorice. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And mm -hmm. very good. it's very good. It just gives it a, a hint of the spice, the spicy. Mm -hmm. really really the sponge nice. being so buttery as well, isn't it? So the licorice kind of cuts through it a little bit. Cuts through. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, yeah, it works. That's that. really good, actually. With the cream, it's absolutely delicious. Finally, my black forest trifle. This is uh, the big fella. That's delicious, Paul. God, oh, that's... Uh, cherries. Mm -hmm. the cherries. <laughs> that's something, isn't it? Cherries with the clove really work. Isn't it? Mm. You get that hint at the yeah. end of the clove. Just beautiful. Oh, just lifts it. In the chocolate crust, you can get the nutmeg, can't you? Just. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. Mm. That's a dangerous pudding. That's a beautiful pudding. I don't really have a sweet tooth. I'm not mad into puddings, but I could eat a whole bowl God, of that. We're going, back, <laughs> we're going back for seconds. Yeah. <laughs> this is what food's all about. It's about experimentation. It's about trying different flavours and pushing yourselves that little bit. I hope you'll try these recipes at home. Join me next time. See you then. Anyone want one of my uh, Hollywood eyes? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, please. Oh. Yeah. Make it two. <laughs> <laughs>